Good evening. I'm Cindy Hyder, and I'm the Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors at Filmstreams. On behalf of the Board, I would like to thank you for joining us for Sea Change, a celebration of four women directors in documentary film, Ramona, Grace, Yoruba, Lucy. I would now like to introduce you to the Executive Director of Filmstreams, Dia Drahaj. So let's talk for a minute. So um, I am Dear Drahaj, and I've had the pleasure of working here in Omaha and at Film Streams for just a little over a year. And I did work in the documentary sector for a little over a decade before I came here. So I'm just thrilled that you all showed up for these filmmakers tonight. I came here for a lot of different reasons, but this program, Sea Change, stood out to me. That's because we see initiatives like this in film uh, pretty often at different levels in the film industry. But until the, I came to film streams, I've never seen it in the marketplace. So in other words, there are grants, there are scholarships, there are internships. Um, there are even gender parity programs at festivals, like the one I ran. There are gender parity programs, some in distribution and some at the studios. But here, at the cinema level, I've never seen that. And as we know, it takes the marketplace to demand change. It takes the marketplace for us to see change happen. I happen to love the work of all four of our guests deeply, and I know these women and their work very, very much. Lucy Walker and I have known each other since 2010 when her film Wasteland won the Audience Award at Full Frame, which was my former gig. She's twice been nominated for the Oscar. Her new series, How to Change Your Mind, is topping the Netflix chart as we speak. Ramona Diaz, actually, um, her bio is a little late in the folder you have. She actually won the Peabody Award just recently. For A Thousand Cuts, her film about Nobel Prize winning journalist Maria Ressa. She graciously allowed me to interview her just at the start of the pandemic in an online discussion, and I'm so glad she's here in person. Grace Lee is also a Peabody Award winner. Her film, The Evolution of Grace Lee Boggs, is a seminal film about about an incredible woman. She is the co-chair of the International Documentary uh, Association's board. She is co-founder of ADOC, which represents Asian American filmmakers in the United States. But equally important to me is Grace had the courage and all of these women to do what they do are incredibly courageous. She had the courage to speak truth to power and with her podcast, viewers like us held PBS accountable and said, you know, it's really a discrepancy in public funding when Ken Burns gets all the big budgets and we all call him a master and nobody else gets the same kind of opportunity. Last but not least is Yoruba Richin, whose work I first saw, um, her film was The New Black. Her most recent work, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, just premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York a few uh, just in May, actually, a few months ago. She's a recipient of both the Guggenheim and the Fulbright and all of these amazing women, I can't wait for you to hear from tonight. Let's take a look at their work. I'm interested in messy lives. Really, at the end of it all, I'm interested in lived experiences because that's what I do. I show the audience lived experiences, and then invite them to go on this journey. And at the end of the journey, they see the world anew. That's how I'm drawn to the films they make. Actually seeing women doing the things that we are told we are often not able to do will inspire people. I'm interested in the new American majority. I'm interested in immigrants. I'm interested in Asian Americans. I'm interested in women. I'm interested in stories that haven't been the forefront of what we've learned in our history books and also who we see in mainstream media. When I started doing documentary film, there were just so few models of African-American women directors. I sought out mentors who were men, who were very generous and, and wonderful in mentoring, but there were so few women of color directors who were making films. I 
I think as a filmmaker, I'm not kind of an activist hoping to persuade people of a point of view exactly. But I do think the more aware we become of what is actually happening in the world, the better we can respond and bring all our beautiful human awareness to the situation. Thank you all so much for being here. Joining us are uh, Lucy Walker, Ramona Diaz, Yoruba Richin, and Grace Lee. So I want to begin here, this Q&A, with a little definition of terms. So my first question is going um, to be open to everyone, but I really want uh, Yoruba and Lucy to talk a little bit about this because of the themes that come up in your work and your approach to your filmmaking. So what is the difference between journalism and documentary filmmaking? Well, I was listening to Yoruba talking about this outside. I was like, Yoruba, you go, because this is wonderful. I can give you a couple of things from my perspective, but I was really thrilled because you teach in a journalism school and um, you, you got me thinking. I'd say a couple of things for me is I hold myself to the same standards as a journalist. Um, I feel a little, little bit like we're an unlicensed journalist. <laughs> and I also try to be non-extractive. I think a lot of documentary um, films can feel a little extractive of other people's journalism. And I um, actually try not to be, and I kind of pride myself in original reporting, so to speak. Um, and um, But then for me, I very much trained as a filmmaker and loved the craft of film and went to film school and feel so lucky to have had that real craft training. Um, and so I sort of aim for the best of both worlds, but that's a really um, sort of untrained sort of, that's my own personal, I want to, I want to sophisticate, sophisticate me. No, I, hi everyone. <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming and thank, uh, thank you to Film Streams for, for having yes, us here. Yes, For sure, this has been wonderful. Um, you know, I think it is, I don't think there is a, uh, you know, a hard and fast line. I don't think there is a, you know, this is the difference and this is the similarities and this is how you like adhere to them. Um, from my own experience, I, um, I didn't go to film school, I didn't go to journalism school. <laughs> so I'll start there. Um, but uh, I started, um, I actually came from a background in theater many, many moons ago. Um, and I started making videos in the late 90s when I was in graduate school for something totally different. Um, and uh, so it, for me, a lot of it was kind of just finding my way. Um, I do, I started a documentary program at uh, CUNY City University of New York Journalism School. Um, so I have a, run a documentary program in a journalism school. Um, so I talk about this a lot. Uh, and I also was at ABC News and Democracy Now! for a number of years on this more journalism side. Um, so I guess what I think is that uh, one of the things that has been interested, interesting in my um, trajectory is that I've seen uh, the demise of journalism and investment of journalism, sort of traditional news, um, at the same time as the growth of documentary. And that started to happen in kind of like the early 2000s. Um, and I saw how documentary was supplanting a lot of the sort of long form, deep dive into stories, um, embeddingness that used to, you know, kind of more happen in the news. So that's one thing that I think um, that we've seen, and you know, it's certainly true true today, um, where documentary has uh, taken the place of a lot of that long form journalism and that investment in stories and in international stories and in investigative stories. The other thing is, I do think. Um, as Lucy said, you know, as documentarians, we have more artistic freedom, as we should, because we're filmmakers. It's an art. Documentary filmmaking is an art. But I also do think that um, I, at least personally, and I think, you know, I would say generally, and tell me you got, if you guys think different, that there's an accuracy um, that we need to 
uh, you know, we need to adhere to. So it's not like, it's not, you know, that we're just report just the facts, ma'am, but there's an accuracy in our storytelling that um, can, we can learn a lot from journalism about how to do that. So everything from, you know, fact checking to how we are working with subjects, how we are asking questions, how we um, interpreting events, how we're looking at archival footage, you know. Again, we have creative leeway, which journalism doesn't. Journalists generally don't have, but I do think um, that documentary uh, has to, if it's going to call itself a documentary, has to have an accuracy uh, about it. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot because I just made a film about a journalist and. Um, in a thousand cuts, and Maria Ressa, who's one of the main participants or the main participant in the film, we've been having this conversation back and forth for like three years now. Because she says I'm a journalist, I say I'm not, and I think the difference is, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not objective, and I'm open about that because I think the tools of film sort of resist objectivity in a way. So what we do, I think, the the way I see, it, what I do are more closely adhere to opinion pieces, op-eds, right? Um, but because as filmmakers, we sculpt, I mean, we sculpt time and space. That's what film is, right? And we use the language of film. And that's not, those things don't necessarily add up to being objective. But like Yoruba said, we do adhere to facts, right? We don't say it's night when it's day or this happened in 2000 when it happened in 2010. I mean, there are facts that we closely adhere to because I think there is a contract with the audience once with documentaries that you are adhering to facts. Once you lose that, you lose the audience and you lose uh, credibility. Yeah, I mean, just to add quickly, I mean, objectivity is a whole... <laughs> a whole other panel. A whole other panel. But I, I will say, like, I hear what you're saying, but let's also remember journalism. There was a time, think of H.L. Mencken and crusading journalists who were doing journalism in, uh, that, weren't, that wasn't objective. So this notion of objectivity, I think, is also needs to be sort of questioned and looked upon and what really is objective and what's not. I mean, that's kind of more from a journalism thing. But... Um, I just think it's important to, you know, to put that out there. Objectivity can serve a purpose and can serve certain uh, people in power, essentially. Right. Um, and you know, journalism has had a long tradition of not being objective mm -hmm. and of you know, it, while using the facts, while showing what's happened, all of that, but you know, showing what's going on and, and what... Uh, you know, specific communities um, are, are under, you know, are, are people in power are doing, you know. So anyway, I just wanted to, to put that out there too. I was going to say, I just had the experience. Um, I had a Netflix show. I think you just saw a clip from Bring Your Own Brigade. I also um, this week had a Netflix show that, um, that I made come on um, with the uh, professor of journalism, Michael Pollan adapted from his book, How to Change Your Mind About Psychedelics. So it was an incredible privilege to work with somebody who's an amazing journalist, writer, and, and professor. And his book is the most beloved book on the subject and so authoritative, and he has so much credibility. But it's a very um, uh, older white male perspective. And so and one of the critiques of the book was that it, was, it, 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 it had written some women out of history and whose objectivity was it. And so sort of trying to find that balance of kind of... Um, as the documentarian, um, kind of correcting the journalism, not correcting, that's the wrong word, but adapting the journalism, or as I, I felt trying to sort of um, round out the journalism in, in, as we adapted it for the screen was a really um, interesting um, thing that actually Michael was incredibly open and, and wonderful about. And really, I think he, he'd had his eyes opened by the reception to the book about what it may have ad admitted. So, but... but yeah, that was, I just did the, this dance, I'm realizing. Yeah, um, Lucy and Grace, I, I wanted to ask a follow-up to that, um, Lucy, because you just, you know, made this project with Netflix, and Grace is, um, you know, co-chair of the, the IDA, um, the International Documentary Association. I think this is a really important conversation to have, because I feel like a lot of people in this room, through streamers in particular, probably have more access to documentary filmmaking than they've ever had before. Um, do you, as 
documentary filmmakers feel like documentary is booming or is that just a feeling that we have on the audience side because of the kind of how many projects we're getting on these different platforms at There's one time people, i guess yeah i mean yes i think more people in general know what documentaries are they see them on the streamers um you know, but there's also this distinct, we talk about journalism and documentary and then reality and like all of these terms are sort of thrown out there. Um, but, you know, I, I do, uh, me personally, like I feel like there are a lot more outlets um, interested in nonfiction storytelling, um, including podcasting. I mean, I made a podcast last year. Um, so I think that it's not just visual nonfiction storytelling that's happening, but also in audio formats as well as, as many others. I have um, a, a thought. Um, it's so wonderful to have this panel and this opportunity. Thank you, everyone who made this happen. Because I feel like we're kind of actively, um, you know, we're really act being active about um, raising up um, us women. And thank you for that. Um, but uh, I do think there's. It feels like there's more opportunity, and the audience is loving um, nonfiction work. But I, I, I've also noticed um, during my career that actually I feel like now uh, the sort of money and um, eyeballs and, and there's, there's a, bit, a little bit more um, kind of attention paid to the nonfiction space that actually a lot of the power players and actually a lot of those are kind of studios and the same kind of Hollywood, which is... Um, which is um, more male dominated than the documentary space has been and more um, you know sort of um, imbalanced I actually feel like a lot of those people have kind of gold rushed in and it reminds me a little bit about the early days of Hollywood actually because there were some female pioneers I think in the very early days but as soon as it stopped becoming this kind of um, new creative edge um, and started becoming like big money big power big you know uh, swinging around kind of thing, if that makes any sense. Um, uh, then, you know, the women actually got really sort of depressed by that um, new energy. And I, I sometimes feel that too. I'm like, there's all this money, there's all this stuff, but how, how is it that when I look across at the women that I most um, admire, some of us are kind of like working harder than ever, but and a lot of people are making money, but it's not us, you know? And I sometimes wonder about that. Although some people are doing really well, which is great. That's a that's a really good analogy. I didn't think of it that way, but I think there's there's something to that. Um, I think that, as I mentioned, seeing the demise of the network news um, and the news industry um, being in it at the time, and the growth of um, of of documentary films supplanting that. The thing that always stands out for me is I think it was 2003 when Fahrenheit 9/11 came out, uh, Michael Moore's film. Um, and I remember I was working at ABC News, and you know cuts were starting. Like the you know it was the sort of the 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 beginning of this continuation of cutting, cutting, cutting international um, bureaus and and investigative bureaus. And I remember going to see uh, Fahrenheit 9/11 at BAM, uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, and the lines were around the corner, around the corner. And I'd never seen that for a documentary film. And I was like, that was like a switch. I was like. Mm oh, something is changing and it's shifting. And I do think that the, um, and that's even before sort of the advent of the streamer, um, but that the audience, the audiences, I mean, I meet so many people who are like, I love watching documentaries. Like, we didn't have that growing up, <laughs> you know? So there's definitely like the audience has been um, groomed or, to, you know, conditioned or, and I, and I think that's a good thing. I think that, you know, I think that is, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, having the money and, and all of that and who benefits is certainly a question, but I think that the audience appetite for a documentary is, is there and, and, and for, for podcasts, I mean, the growth of podcasts is amazing and then podcasts that become documentaries and the synergy, so. But it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, it's great. I think there's more attention on documentaries now than ever before because of the streamers. But they've also defined what documentary is, right? And so the popularity of 
uh, uh, crime, uh, you know, crime thrillers, stuff like that. And they talk about documentaries like it's, um, documentary is not a genre, right? So within documentary, there are different kinds of documentaries. And I think because the streamers sort of have defined, of course the popular ones are thrillers and stuff. There's less room, I think, to, um, for innovation, to experiment with form, um, uh, which is unfortunate. So, and I notice that with my own work, when I start talking about, uh, maybe it's this kind of form and maybe it's like, Fragmented time, is, you see the horror in the stakeholder face. Fragmented time, yes. Uh, so you're like, no, but it will still, it's not experimental. And you almost have to like, uh, right, be apologetic about what you just said. But I'm like, no, 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 it is. Trust me. <laughs> so it is, it is a double-edged sword. But yes, uh, I mean, documentaries are here and it's great. There's a lot of eyeballs on it. I would also just add, in addition to true crime or like music themed films or films about celebrities, there's so many celebrity driven films these days. If you want to tell like an old fashioned story about, you know, somebody in the community that nobody knows about, but they have a fascinating life. Um, I mean, it's it's a lot harder to, you know, convince investors or a company or whatever to to make that film or historical, or historical docu yeah, yeah historical which i do a lot of historical are stuff still so really hard to yeah. to fund um and for me like that's one of the reasons i got into documentaries is because it is a kind of correcting the record it is a kind of like telling a perspective on history that you've never heard before um and if you don't you don't know it to say that you want to see that you know as a film because it hasn't existed yet so this is also you know part of the um, challenge. Mm -hmm. I think going off of that, I have some questions that are all kind of tied to one another, which is at this point in your careers, like how much does like the market at all influence how you shape a story, uh, how you're going to tell a story, what kinds of stories you pursue, but then also on a more creative side, like how do you know some, that something is a good story and not just like a good topic? that is timely? Like, is there a difference? What is that difference? I'll answer that question by giving you a story, <laughs> right? So I made a film about, uh, it's called Don't Stop Believing, about the uh, um, lead singer of Journey, American band Journey. And uh, yeah, and he happened to be Filipino singing in this marginalized like dives in the Philippines. He wasn't even famous in the Philippines and they flew him out and he, he auditioned for them and got the gig, and we followed his first year with the band. And when I first uh, um, heard of the story, actually it was my, uh, my manager who said, you should make this film. And I said, I don't want to make this film. I don't want to deal with the rock stars, because I just had dealt with Imelda Marcos, who then sued me. So I said, I don't want to deal with the rock stars. And they said, no, no, you really should tell this story. You should. And, um, um, and I said, so one thing led to another, and we, we found ourselves in Northern California doing a sample tape with the band. And that was the very first time I met Arnell. And he was lovely. I mean, he was so... And there was one question I asked, and he could have given me a rote answer. And he said, I asked him, so how are you feeling, Arnell? He goes, you know, I just want to go home. I'm so tired. I want to be... Better. He was so unfiltered. And that's when I knew I wanted to make it because it could have been a five-minute YouTube film, you know, about this guy who gets a film. It, but because he was very articulate about his inner life and what was going to happen to him, you could tell. So for me, it's character, you know, because of the films I make. They're character-driven. So once I meet the, meet the character and, you know, I, I become enamored of them and can't sleep, then I know how to make it, right? If it keeps me up at night, then I know how to make it. But yeah. it's all about... The character. Um, I, I think I would agree too. I mean, none of the films I made are commercially successful. <laughs> They're all driven by like, I, I have a question or I need to know. The, the film that was shown here about Grace Lee Boggs, American Revolutionary, I met her while I was making another film and you know, went to Detroit and just was like, who is this person? I need to know more about her. I need to be around her more. And it just became a kind of obsession. And it wasn't driven by like some kind of market. It was like, I need to know this story. And I need to figure out for myself how to tell this story because I will somehow evolve 
you know, in the process of making this film. So it's a very personal journey for me. Um, other pro <clears throat> you know, I've also done work for hire, which is, it's not about me, like, finding the money and all that. It's more about, like, am I engaged with this story? Like, for example, um, the Asian American series that was on PBS, it tells 150 years of American history through an Asian lens. Um, and that had never really been done before. And I wanted to engage in that because, again, you know, one of the reasons I got into <coughs> filmmaking is to see the stories that I didn't get to see when I was growing up and trying to understand, you know, my place in this country. So, yeah, I would just add um, for me, it's like it, you know, film, films come to me in different ways. So the film that was shown here, uh, How It Feels to Be Free, uh, was based on a book, inspired by a book. Um, and I read a, um, a review of the book. And as soon as I read the review, I hadn't, hadn't even read the book. I was like, this would make a great film. And that was the beginning of that journey. And it becomes obsessive. It becomes like I can't sleep or I'm thinking about it or I'm seeing it and seeing how, you know, how it could be a film. Um, and also, too, I've discovered, and I tell my students this, too, when I talk to people about a top, like if I'm developing it and I talk to people, and if I see them get excited, that's, that's <laughs> then cool. I know, okay, I'm on to something. If their eyes glaze over, then I'm like, well, maybe this is only interesting to me. <laughs> and, you know, that's, I think it's important because you're, not, you're making this film for the, you know, for con consumption, like yeah. not just for yourself. So um, I actually f have, it's been very helpful for me, for me to talk through my ideas with mm -hmm. colleagues and people that I trust um, to see if it's a, a good yeah. story. Yeah, actually, Lucy, this brings me to a question I wanted to ask you about um, audience. Yeah, um, oh, I was just gonna say, I call that the cocktail party test. It's a really useful one. Like, do they say, oh, I've just gotta go get a drink. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when they are, wh wh when, the, when you've told them, they, they first of all, they say, what are you working on now? And you'll explain, they're like, be right back. Or they'll say, oh, my God, tell me more. Yeah. Like Amish teenagers on crystal meth. Tell me more, you know. <laughs> but um, other things, you're like the history of the nuclear weapons and why they're still really, no, he lost them, whatever it is. Yes. Yeah, but that, that kind of brings me to that question. Is like, when, when do you begin thinking about the audience in the process? Is it in the editing room? Is it prior to, like, is it, do you do these little tests purposefully? Because I know you have a really interesting background in children's television. Yes. That, ta that thought about audience testing in a yeah. very specific way. Yeah, exactly. Um, My first yeah. job, and some of you may have watched it as toddlers, because I can't see out there, but you may have some young people out there. Um, my very first job out of film school, I got it when I was actually still in grad school um, with Andrew, who's somewhere in the audience. Um, yes, we were in grad school together. And my first job was directing Nickelodeon's Blue's Clues. I did 20 episodes of that show. Yes. Yes, it's such a fun um, job and such good training, actually. Um, and uh, one thing that uh, we did on the show that was kind of rad at the time, especially, was it was tested on three, four, and five-year-olds uh, at every stage of um, uh, prep and you know, at script and storyboard and um, with animatic. And, and um, the show, for those of you who may not know, this classic of children's uh, television, um, the audience sort of shouts answers. And so there's a real kind of quantifiable... Um, are they getting the answer or not? And I really learned that, um, for example, if the host is asking, what does Blue the dog want to eat today? And the audience has to shout out the answer. Um, although I suppose dogs usually eat the same thing. So it's not a very good example. But, um, uh, but, the, but the audience is supposed to say, behind you or something like that. But you really start to notice that if there's a little animated bird in the corner of the screen, they're going to miss the answer. And you start to really understand um, the sort of really engineer um, the audience, like how much of cognitively of what you're showing on the screen the audience is able to keep up with and I think actually when you're making non-fiction especially because it's not scripted and you know, sometimes it's actually just for audiences to track like what are you talking about is that the same person or their sister you know uh, because people change there's no continuity people gain weight get a haircut get a different outfit it's like a year since you last filmed with them and people can't even remember because they were actually like um 
checking their phone when they were like that scene came on. You know, you have to be really, I think, um, really conscious of that. And I always actually really like test screenings as well for audience feedback. It's been really, um, it's always always really helpful for me to actually understand um, how much people are, uh, are getting and and I always will deliberately solicit negative feedback. Like, where are you bored? Who do you hate? You know, <laughs> um, what do you want to cut? Um, where were you confused? Um, what hate? What, what do you? What bugs you about this whole thing? You know, and um, and that's been uh, really helpful to me. Um, and back to that, I think that story question is really key key because I do think it's a kind of quite narrative. It's very exacting. The narrative of film, the attention span is very. Um, hard taskmaster and it's it, it's if it, you know it's it's tough to feed a narrative and i think stories do that and to, to try and make it start from a topic and find a story that can um carry the audience's attention there's loads of such important topics in the world but how do you like keep people's attention and pull it through um a story and really pay pay off that time that they're they're giving you so so I always think about the generosity of the audience giving you that time and attention and how do you really um make that a rich and rewarding experience when there's so many other things you're competing with for their time I I was I I heard the question differently I thought you were asking like who is the audience mm. I mean but that's also you know how how does the audience follow <laughs> um anyway I'm not sure if what Whichever one you yeah. want. <laughs> I mean, I, I also think about the audience a lot because especially if you're taking a topic that is, you know, foreign to them, you know, how do they engage with it? Like, what is their, you know, for example, um, if you're telling, you know, talking about Asian American history, which nobody learns in schools, um, how do you sort of prime the audience to be prepared, you know? Uh, you know, the, 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 the Asian American series was something that was really interesting. We had a almost entire... Asian American creative team, and Rowena Padrina is here, who is on that crew as well. Um, and it was interesting just to think about, like, how do we shape the story to, you know, um, offer it to like the general public television audience who doesn't know anything about this. And so, um, you know, that for some of us who had some background in Asian American history, we had to kind of cater, you know, sort of, I'm not saying dumb it down, but just also offer some background or context, you know, within the larger American history story so that you could sort of be primed to, you know, follow the story of this Japanese American family, um, you know, over the, you know, World War II experience and how that might you know, be um, confirmed or challenge your ideas of what was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Thank you. I want to kind of stop and be a little meta right now, right? Because you all are so brilliant. Aren't they brilliant? They're the most brilliant. <laughs> and the question I'm going to ask is one that I, that I personally struggle with but it's at the crux of everything that we're doing right now, which is sea change and talking about not just your experience as filmmakers and process and all this stuff, but when you are a woman filmmaker or when you're a filmmaker of color, you're asked to speak about filmmaking from the position of your identity. And there are a lot of female filmmakers that don't want to do so, right? Whether they're documentarians or whether they're working in narrative features. Um, you know, there are probably Latino filmmakers who are just tired of only being asked about that aspect of their work rather than the work itself. Um, how do you all feel about talking about filmmaking from the perspective of your identity? Well, there's no way I can separate my identity from my filmmaking and what I do and how I see the world, and how I see the world informs, you know, is, is part and parcel of my filmmaking. So I don't recoil from that, or um, try to, you know, say I'm not a black filmmaker, or I'm not a black woman filmmaker, because I am. <laughs> um, however, I also want the opportunity to do, um, to, you know, to do many different kinds of films, mm -hmm. and not just to do films that are, you know, focus on African-American issues. Mm -hmm. So that's where, where I 
the tension. You know, that's, yeah. I want to be able to do films, you know, I mean, my films you know, largely do focus on African-American issues because there's so many stories and so, so many stories out there, like so many, <laughs> it could, you know, that I want to tell or that I don't think have been told. But I also... Um, you know, I'm doing a film right now about the development of the birth control pill. And, you know, I was, it's a work for hire and I'm it's super fascinating and I'm, I'm, you know, really psyched to be working on it and it's not specifically racially focused. So I want to have those kind of opportunities too. Um, and, but I'm a black woman filmmaker, like that's cannot be denied. And I would never want to deny, deny that. What Yoruba said, basically. <laughs> Very much so. Um, yeah, I am um, a Philippine American filmmaker, uh, female, so I, and I gravitate towards those films and trying to unpack things that are happening really in the Philippines. So every film I make really, because I live in this liminal space, right, between the U.S. and the Philippines. That's where I live. It's a very interesting space to be as a documentary filmmaker because you get to observe. It's also a lonely place to be. Mm. But so I, I always feel like when I make a film, it's a yearning, really, for the motherland because I've chosen to live here. Um, um, so, yes, I embrace it fully, and that's who I am. That's who my voice is. What, what bugs me these days, though, can I tell you what bugs me these days? Of course. Um, is I'd rather you I'm, only tell me what bugs you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, when I make a film, it's always like, why is it important to the West? Mm -hmm. And you're like, why are 27,000 Filipinos getting killed important to the West? Because, they're 20, because those are 20, 27,000 killings, right? So that, that sort of lens and always trying to shift that lens within my film to make it... <laughs> important to West when it should be important because people are dying right so that's what I think I'm resisting so, and that's more like content and and fighting within in my work mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. yeah Lucy Grace I mean Lucy you've been all over the world with your work um, and Grace you make you know you've made very personal projects also centered around Asian American history like you said um, is like, have you ever gotten pushback on the types of uh, subjects you want to pursue because of your identity? Um, well, I would just reiterate what Yoruba and Ramona said. I mean, I, I embrace, I'm an Asian American, Korean American woman, filmmaker, and I've never been ashamed of it. It's, it's sort of why I pursue the kinds of projects that I do, but I think I also sort of think about, like, for example, the Grace Lee Bog stories. That's not a typical story that you might have heard of. Um, also, you know, I've also made films that aren't about Asian Americans. You know, I made a film about, like, a conservative, well, this was kind of a fiction hybrid film that took place at the Iowa caucuses about a conservative Iowa housewife. You know, that's my Midwestern background mm -hmm. that's coming through that I'm tapping into. You know, I'm interested in stories about, like, being a parent. You know, it's, it's, there's so many facets of my identity, but I think, you know, easily, it's easily to sort of, you know, look at me and say, oh, she's going to make films about Asian women. Um, the flip side of, I have a, a, a thing that happens to me, has happened to me recently because there's such a demand in like the documentary world to like, we need to get that person to tell that story, you know, like get the Asian woman to tell that Asian story. And somebody came to me to, you know, pitch, you know, we, we think it'd be perfect to tell this story. It's sort of like a sports story involving like a Korean American. And I just wasn't that interested in the character or the sport that she was interested in. So, you know, I made the decision just to say, well, you know, I would love to be considered for things that aren't about <laughs> Korean Americans, <laughs> women, um, but, mm. you know, the sort of like, you know, getting pigeonholed in a certain way uh, because, you know, my interests are so vast and, you know, it, it is very personal why I choose to um, pursue a topic or pursue a, an idea. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more with all, all this um, and the multifaceted, you know, nature. Um, uh, right now, I'm having a wonderful time um, making a documentary film about a Sherpa woman who just summited Everest for the tenth time. She holds the record for Everest summits, and actually, we were trying to get hold of some archival material. Um, 
of a film that she'd done about, her, the, a film was made about her first Everest summit. And the filmmakers were outraged that I was telling the story um, because I'm not from Nepal. And um, what was interesting was I had actually loved, she, the, the Lakpa, the star of the documentary, has immigrated and lives in Connecticut. And um, I found of all my subjects, actually, I kind of bonded with her the most because we were kind of, we, we had had this experience as I grew up in the UK of, of kind of coming to the US. Um, and we, we, shared, we shared a lot, even though we also are completely different. Um, but no one would see that, you know. And um, so I... I I think it's important to just keep asking questions. I, I try to challenge myself as well, constantly um, challenge myself. My film, Bring Your Own Brigade, was actually a kind of challenge to myself about can I um, turn the lens on my own community, kind of come come closer to home? Do I need a kind of exotic you know, plane ticket or a place I want to go to make me a filmmaker that's got interesting stuff? Um, and... Uh, so I, I, I think that's something I ask myself as well. But I, I got into, um, I, I just had a moment uh, one time when I was asked to do the women's panel at Sundance. I was so excited you get a call for saying, would you like to be on a panel at Sundance? And of course, I love, you know, those calls. Um, and then for like the fifth year running, it was the women's panel. And I just had a moment, I said to them, I would like to talk about some craft. You know, I pride myself on my craft pride myself on my filmmaking you know and all that I pour into it I'd love to be seen for that I'd love for them to be more women on the why am I directing is so incredible panel or like how I collaborate with my amazing people because I'm such an artist panel you know all these other like really prestigious panels stuffed with men and then there's the women panel talking about women women I, I, I too I'm absolutely I'm a very um out feminist I'm very um all about like who I am and that being how I see the world and that being very important and very proud of um very proud that I've struggled and hopefully I can inspire other women I think it's so important that we have much better representation um of who's making things in this world and whose points of view we're looking at but um so anyway I said I had this moment with Sundance I was like not again with the women's panel and um then they called me back and they said no it's fine it's fine we're recalling it the gender panel it'll be five women but we added a man <laughs> and um I thought just do better you know but this is fantastic because we're being I think we're actively engaging with it right and I think this I really love this conversation this is really fruitful um, I think what we're getting at is something else that I'm also really interested in, which is this theme that keeps coming up when you talk about um, uh, filmmaking and identity is who gets to tell a certain story, right? Who has the right to a story? Um, and I want to read something that, Grace, you wrote a couple years ago. Um, it was uh, a kind of provocation that you were asked to write about something that was just kind of bugging you. <laughs> and then it became, um, I think, a call to action about... Uh, who gets to tell a story and where especially public funding goes. So I'm going to read um, just a paragraph from this essay that you wrote um, in current um, it, that's uh, addressed to PBS. Your commitment to diversity at PBS is not borne out by the evidence. When you program an eight-part series on Muhammad Ali by Ken Burns, what opportunity is there for a series or even a one-off film to be told by a black storyteller who may have a decidedly different view? Your chief programming executive recently announced an initiative to fund, quote, the next generation, unquote, of BIPOC makers, but where does that leave the current generation? This is about equitable support for BIPOC filmmakers to author their own narratives at all stages of their careers that rival the access and support seen by their white peers. Emerging filmmaker initiatives enforce the false narrative that BIPOC artists are predominantly first timers, lacking in experience. Is there a question? <laughs> <laughs> Can you just tell uh, tell us a little bit about um, where this came from? You've worked a lot with PBS, yep. right? This is um, 
I'm going to say maybe a bit of a risk, right, to be so open about um, criticizing, uh, like, a, a still a large supporter of documentary film. Yeah, I mean, the the so this essay came about um, the Ford Foundation Just Films, um, you know, asked 40 artists, filmmakers, journalists to write a provocation about the future of our field and, you know, documentary. This was in the summer of 2020, um, which a lot was going on then. Um, and I, at th that same summer, I had had two series on public television. One was this Asian American series. The other was And She Could Be Next, which Yoruba also worked on, which is about uh, women of color transforming American politics as candidates and organizers. We followed historic races across the country, including Stacey Abrams, Rashida Tlaib, Lucy McBath, Veronica Escobar, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I had had a lot of experience just, you know, and also finishing films in a pandemic um, coming out in the summer of 2020. So I wanted to talk about public television and like what it's for. Um, and so the essay really came out just to sort of talk about, you know, sort of the elephant in the room about public television, you know, and, and which is publicly funded. You know, it was started, PBS was started in the midst of another racial reckoning in the United States in the late 60s. Um, and it was created, the mission was to reflect all of America. Um, at the same time, you know, public television, PBS has always been sort of the home of Ken Burns, who has, you know, for 40 years been what, and even advertised as America's storyteller. So I just wanted to ask, you know, why is that? You know, why, why does this, why does he get to take up so much space when we're really trying to reflect all of America? I'm not saying don't give him any space, but just, you know, offer opportunities for other people who've been doing this for a long time. Um, so anyway, it was, it was just a, a provocation meant to start a conversation. And it was risky because I remember showing to a lot of different people, maybe I even showed it to you, um, because, you know, PBS is the place for a lot of filmmakers of color to get an opportunity to make something, you know, um, prior to streamers and all of this. It's, it's, it is part of the mandate to reflect America's stories. So, you know, I feel like I wanted to do that just in order to say, like, let's do, let's do a better job at this because look at this country right now. We need to reflect all of America, um, if we, especially if you're being publicly funded by all of us, right? And all of us aren't just telling the stories that Ken Burns is telling. So mm -hmm. that's where it came from. Yeah, and, and if any of y'all are interested, um, Grace has a wonderful podcast called Viewers Like Us, um, which is really important in distilling not just this this moment of needs for diversity and inclusion in PBS programming, but a kind of historical a way that PBS has looked at its programming and has been aware of this issue of diversity and inclusion in their programming and has chosen to do very little about it. Um, and I think why I wanted to kind of bring this up um, is because I, I actually, I have a question here about gatekeeping, right? Who are gatekeepers? We don't have to name them, right? But in your experience and in your perception of it, what is the definition of a gatekeeper? Before I answer yeah. the, the, that, I just wanted to say, you know, I think it's really important that we recognize that filmmakers of color uh, specifically have not been able to tell their stories yeah. historically. I mean, it's really a new thing, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and it's a new thing within the documentary. I started working in documentary in the, the late 90s, mm -hmm. and I, you know, can count on my hand, and it wouldn't even take my full hand, the number of particularly black filmmakers that I saw that were able to make a living making documentary films. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, and, and I mean, it's, it's a completely different, it was, it's, it's a really different world in terms of that. So I think it's important, we're not just saying, you know, oh, we need to be able to tell our stories or PBS, you need to diversify because we think it's cute. <laughs> like it's, there was a real barrier to access there. Barrier in terms of money, in terms of trust, in terms of role models, in terms of even just of programming and even belief that we could do it. Um, so I think it's, we need to start there of under, by, un, uh, you know, to understand, 
you know, why we are still calling for this mm -hmm. because of where historically things have been. I mean, I've been on panels, and I'll just end with this, where I've had, um, you know, old white men who worked for PBS, who were the, who were the people PBS mm -hmm. hired to tell these stories of people of color in the 60s and 70s, turn to me and say, oh, now I can't get a job because they just are interested in you. I've had that happen on a panel. Right. Yeah. So, Same. you know, the, the well, <laughs> it's, it's tough I, out there for white guys. Uh, this, this is this. Did you see that? Somebody actually said that recently, but I, it's, I, it's uh, in public, and there was it was I it was an easy um, retweet. But um, uh, but uh, but I hear it a lot off the record. Yes. Um, yeah. The, the white men have this, you know, yeah. if, 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 uh, you know, pr your privilege being taken away feels yes. um, it's it, it's 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 fascinating to observe. I, you say? know, and I think the con <laughs> people react so badly because they are hearing that they can't make it right. They can't tell these stories. But that's not what we're really talking about. We're talking about parity. Right. We're talking about access to resources that people of color and female filmmakers have seldom had or have never had until now because we're fighting for it and we're talking about it. But they're hearing that, oh, we can't, we, you know, you're disallowing us to tell certain stories. That's, that's what's heard. And, that's, and then everyone gets like uh, angry <laughs> over this conversation when that isn't what we're saying. I think people are so un, you know, I, I think also that, you know, for a long time, I wouldn't say something like that, right? Yeah. I would just kind of keep my mouth shut. But I think in this moment, when you see Ken Burns doing a, you know, eight part, eight hour series about Muhammad Ali, right? Um, in this moment, you know, in 2020, right? Where's the opportunity for a African American, you know, seasoned filmmaker to make that story? No, it's now it's rebranded as a Ken Burns film, right? Mm -hmm. No one is going to be able to make like that. I mean, yes, many people have made many films about Muhammad Ali, but you know, where's the Yoruba Rishan version of Ken you know, of of Muhammad Ali's, right? Like, I think that that's what I was trying to say. You know, there's so many amazing filmmakers who could tell that story in a different way, um, and you know, let's just like call it out. Mm -hmm. Do you think if yes, clap for that. <laughs> Do you feel, though, as women filmmakers, some of y'all as filmmakers of color, um, do you think there is a greater burden on you to succeed for the types of stories yes. that you tell? Yes. <laughs> and success how is, is that, like, how is that communicated? Like Sundance, right? <laughs> I mean... Yeah, how, how is that communicated? How, how, how do you feel that? Is that working um, in very explicit ways? Are people telling you this? Is it working in um, kind of more insidious ways? Like how does this take shape for creative people in the film industry? Because I think we know it's true, but how, how does that pressure manifest? So I'm thinking about an experience I, I've had recently where I made a film, um, uh, about the killing of Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. And I was paired with a journalist from the New York Times. It was a New York Times uh, production and a white journalist and um, who is, uh, what they do is they pair journalists with the filmmakers, which can be very, you know, very uh, productive um, pairing in terms of, you know, telling the story, especially this story, which was unfolding and we were we were capturing it as it was unfolding the investigation, what happened to her. Um, but I was questioned by this journalist about my objectivity mm. to the uh, producers. They said, could she be objective? Um, so, you know, and this was right in June of 2020. <laughs> so right as the racial reckoning was happening um, and the company was an all-white company. And quite frankly, I don't know if this company would have sought out a black filmmaker before to tell this story. I don't think they'd worked with many filmmakers of color. Um, so there's all that, right? And then you have to make a film. When you're questioned, you know, as you know, somebody who's worked in news, who's worked, who started a documentary program, I'm being questioned 
by this professor of journalism. Yes, I'm being questioned by this uh, reporter if I can be objective in telling this story. So going in with that, yes, I, I have to be successful. And so I don't know, you know how you want to quantify it, how you want to look at it. I know that I have to tell, that I have to um, you know, do my justice to my subject, do justice to the journalism, because it was an investigative story, uh, and do justice to you know, the tragedy and the killing of this woman. Um, and also be accurate and be all those things around journalism. So yes, I have also to appearing to be graceful and not difficult and all those things that get uh, yeah, women I'm, in trouble I'm, in those leadership roles. No? Yeah, I mean, but I did say yes. I'm always graceful, but I'm also <laughs> going said. You know, this is effed up that she said this, and um, and this is a problem. You know, and it's a problem. This whole notion of objectivity is a problem. We were just talking about this before. Who, do, who has that notion of object, objectivity served? You know, it served the police who killed her. That's who it served. Um, and so if we go in looking at, oh, we have to be objective, as opposed to we aren't going to uncover or try to uncover what happened, why this woman was killed, why this tragedy was happened, and that has to be our lens, not about objectivity. Definitely. And isn't it shocking, though? Yes. <laughs> But isn't it shocking that I find like, I'm like, I find myself in these conversations sometimes thinking, oh, we're, we still have to have this conversation. I just did this series and um, it was with uh, another company. It wasn't just with my own company. There's like a, quite a few cooks in the kitchen on this one. And um, uh, this four part series and one part was one episode. It was my idea to um, talk about mescaline and Native American use of sacred medicine peyote as an episode, which I thought would have a lot of upside to it because it's a beautiful story that hasn't been told and Netflix is an incredible platform to get a different story about Native American, um, positive Native American story. Um, uh, but I also really knew that this idea ne you know, needed, it needed Native American representation, it needed Native American leadership, it needed, so, I asked permission to bring on my amazing friend Chris Eyre, who was also at NYU with us, um, at, at to see if he'd come on as a producer and lead this episode. And I was told why. I'm looking at the Zoom, because we were working remote, of white people. I'm asking, like, we can't do this. Like, I, we 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 can't we can't do this. We need Native American <laughs> leadership around this, and just obviously. But you have to have. You, you find yourself having to have conversations you don't think you need to have um, in 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 the world. It, isn't that? Is, you, can you imagine? So yeah. So conversations. That, that's just one example. But there's so many conversations you'd think you wouldn't need to have anymore. At least in my, I kind of grew up with this idea that haven't we figured that out yet? Um, Right, you still need to explain to people that um, that it is it's important who's telling stories, yeah. and that it's important that that <laughs> that is way more representative of the world that we live in, and that it affects the story. I mean, that's the other thing. It's not just to have people of color or women at the helm because it looks pretty. It's this affects how a story is told the lens of which of the storytelling and it makes it a better story to have to have that leadership um and not just you know and, and again like as we said not just in terms of you know stories about people of color stories about women like it should be in all storytelling going off of that um i think uh one of the last questions i have for you before we move on to q and a is you all are around documentary film, you make film, um, but I think you also, you know, have a, know a lot about the landscape. So as filmmakers, but also like as producers, like what is missing right now from documentary film? Like what would you like to see more of or to see something of that maybe isn't even there yet? <laughs> Experimentation, I think. Playing with the form, being more um, 
you know, just putting yourself out there, being more gutsy with form and trying and and this question about succeeding and it's okay to fail once in a while. Uh, I have to tell myself that because, uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, experimentation, like taking a risk. I'd like to see some of the stakeholders, the funders, just um, just take a risk when it comes to form. I think that's what's missing, for one. This is This is kind of like the opposite, like what I think we're having too much of. I think everything doesn't need to be an eight-part series. Oh. Uh, so, yeah. so, so, and I think that would actually free up money for other kinds of uh, storytelling. So I think that there's been an over-reliance, like as we said, it's true crime. It's not that I, I mean, I watch the true crime stuff too, I have to say. So it's not that I'm saying, you know, there are th things that, that, that inter pure entertainment of documentary, you know, is, is a bad thing. But this, this over-reliance on the true crime, on the eight-part series, does squeeze us and squeeze the, um, you know, and, and, and sort of limits the kind of filmmaking I think that Ramona is, is talking about. Lucy, Grace? I want uh, exactly what we're talking about, more women's stories, more stories from underrepresented voices. I want, there's so many stories we, we haven't heard yet and so many points of view that have not been represented and so many filmmakers that barely get a chance, you know, uh, to, to develop their voice, to play, to learn, to grow. Um, to find their groove. I'm so excited about more and more and more of that. But the stakes go, get higher, right? It's <clears throat> tougher than people get scared to experiment. I think that's why when you quoted the thing I wrote, you know, actually giving space and funds to like mid-career filmmakers to really experiment or, you know, tell a story that's not a true crime story or really like hone into like that obscure topic that, you know, you you can only do justice to that by telling it in a really creative way. Um, I think there's this this march to like you know feed the market or like get a series and like I really feel that like I don't want to do that, but you also have to make a living. Um, so it's more like can we can we make more art right? Make stuff that like American Revolutionary took me ten years to make. I didn't work on it full time, but it's something that I had to make and. You know, I'm really happy and pleased with what I did with that, but I just, I don't think I could do that anymore. I can't do it anymore, <laughs> right? Like, not at this age. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that opportunity to really, like, experiment and try something different. Yeah. So at this point, we're going to move on to Q&A. Um, we have about uh, 20 minutes for Q&A. So bikes are being set up here in the aisles. So for... Um, those of you who uh, have a question, please line up to the mic nearest to you. Um, if you have a question, stand behind the mic. If everyone keeps their questions specific and brief and actually questions that we can get through as <laughs> many as possible uh, in the time that we have. Um, so let me begin. I will begin here. Oh, our bike's on. No. I'll just talk loud. So, Grace Lee, my question is for you with PBS. Um, did they respond? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the question, in case everybody didn't hear, was did PBS respond? Yeah. So, so basically, I wrote, I wrote the essay thinking, okay, I'm just going to write it because I need to get it off my chest. But then journalists started asking the president of PBS, like, oh, did you read this thing by Grace Lee? And Paula Kerger, who's the president of PBS, said... Um, well, I respectfully disagree with her, right? And so at the time, I just I was in the middle of some health issues, and I just was like, okay, whatever. But the community around me, a lot of, you know, BIPOC filmmakers, you know, we decided we can't let that go un, un, unchallenged, right? So we actually created um, an open letter to PBS. Um, if you go to BIPOCmakers.com, you can read it. Um, it basically was signed by 800 documentary filmmakers, um, including many, many prominent uh, filmmakers. Um, and just asking, well, why do you respectfully disagree? And then, you know, sort of talking about like, well, you know, where's the data? Where, where is the proof that this is, is 
not the case. You know, PBS is doing a great job with diversity. And so that turned into a whole thing, <laughs> you know, with, with PBS and started a conversation. And that's how the podcast viewers like us came about because we realized like, okay, we want to document this kind of movement to talk about like, how are we going to restore the public to public television? I mean, if we can't get it together with public television that's like funded by us, the taxpayers, how are we going to get, you know, corporate streamers and stuff to change in terms of, you know, what they're trying to do with access and, um, you know, who gets to tell the story? So, yes, they did respond, but then we responded back and we're, we're it's continuing. Yeah. And we'll zigzag over here. I just want to take a second and say thank you for everyone being here and sharing your stories. Um, as a, a woman who has, I've gone to film school, I've, I've lived and worked in LA, and it, it means a lot to kind of hear everyone's different um, you know, journeys, and, and I just thank you, everyone, for coming and sharing your stories tonight. Um, I have a question for each of you, and that is, is there a subject out there that you would love to tell your perspective on, and we talked about like doing your perspective on like you know Ken Burns, Muhammad Ali take, or is there a subject or a person or event that you would love to tackle one day? That's your dream. Dream story. I have a dream series idea, which is basically if you took all of the, <laughs> it's kind of a crazy idea, but. Thinking about PBS, like if you took all this sort of signature series like Civil War, baseball, jazz, and like did them again, yeah, different filmmakers, I think yeah, that'd be really interesting, <laughs> totally. That's awesome. That's great. I don't know. I know. Oh, that's, that's tough. All right. Well, maybe we'll come back to it in the lightning round. Let's go over here. I'm wondering. Uh, if the lesson of uh, your film is that this kind of intervention is impossible in a traditional democratic sense, that we should instead empower designers, architects, builders to afford uh, more, uh, I guess, democratic participation in, uh, in their arts. So the question for Lucy is... Um what is the political purpose to bring your own brigade? Mm, thank you. Thanks so much. I love this detailed question. Thank you. Um, I'm worried a little bit that people may not have seen the whole movie, and um, we should offline about it. I'm at Lucy Walker Film on all the handles, and I'll be here. But um, uh, I think for me, uh, who, who said that? I wish I could remember right this minute because then I could sound really clever, but I forgot who said it. But someone said, if you want to send a message, send a telegram. And I do think that with a film, it's not that. And um, the, the film is a real journey that, you know, I think for me, the learning around the city council meeting, there's an extraordinary city council meeting where you see the town where 86 people were killed by this fire voting down all the measures that the fire department is recommending, even though we, you know, these are our heroes, the fire department, but do we listen to them when they say, this is how you're not going to die when the next fire comes through, which is going to be in five minutes for sure, by the way. Um, for me, it was actually just the shedding the light on that, you know, raising the question and um, the surprise of, of that dimension of the contributing factors and, um, and, and surfacing that as a part of this complicated world that we live in that I hadn't been aware of previously, rather than necessarily having all the answers, because I'm not your fire scientist. I'm just someone on a learning journey that was like, whoa, did you just see that? Because it's, it's one moment I actually, if you haven't seen the movie, I actually put my face on screen, never before, but it was the only way I could, it, it, we happened to have a little moment where the camera was pointing my way um, when we were just changing the lens or something. But there's this look on my face of total disbelief, which was the, the strongest thing we could find in the editing room to try to underline what, to, we, what we just witnessed, which was this extraordinary moment where it seemed that you know democracy wasn't functioning um, to keep people safe. And um, so... Right. Let's move over here. And again, if we keep the questions brief, we have time for about three more questions. My name is Fatima Ibrahim. I'm 17 years old. I'm with the Girls Inc. program here. Yeah. I, um, 
as a student, I'm active with a lot of activism and programs that we have going on with activism and you know climate change, gun violence, other stuff. Um, and you guys speak earlier about how more younger audiences are consuming like documentaries, mostly criminal documentaries, like you guys mentioned, <laughs> but also younger other documentaries. Like I remember seeing um, your documentary Wonder. I remember seeing it when I was younger, and um, you know, like seeing it, like I haven't seen a lot of documentaries, but it was like a lot of information about stuff I didn't know about climate. And you know, I feel like the more kids that are consuming these documentaries, they're taking it as like their base information about these topics. How do you feel about kids like me using them as like fuel for activism? And ooh. Mm. yeah. No, that's a really great question. So how do the filmmakers Love it. Feel, Love it. Yes. Yeah, Live about it. You, your doing films it. being used as sources of information and activism. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of documentary uh, making now is how, so what we call impact uh, or engagement. Um, how can we use our films for in an educational space or to spur activism or to spur... Uh, you know, policy change. Um, and we are thinking about that, I would say, all of us are thinking about that as we conceive of our films, like from the, from the get-go. And it's a really beautiful part of filmmaking, and it's a way that the film, um, you know, you could see how the film is affecting, you know, people like yourself and other people who use it for change, who use it to, for education. Uh, and it's it's a big part of documentary filmmaking now. So I I, I, I know I love you know that's part of the reason why I make the films that I do so that it can have impact. Thank you. Let's move over here. Hi. Um. Thank you again for being here as a filmmaker that hasn't gone to film school, and I live here, not on the coast or anything. This is amazing that you guys are here. Um. So my question is about identity and storytelling, it sounds like there's a contrast between like white male dominated filmmakers and then women and people of color. So my question for you and, and this group over here having like an entitlement or a privilege to tell any story. And so can you talk a little bit about your process in considering if this is a story I should be telling or should I tell this story? That's a great, that was actually one of the questions I had for the many different variations that this conversation could have gone, mm -hmm. which is how do you know you're the person to tell this story? <laughs> well, I, I can answer this um, with, and she could be next. This was the two part documentary about women of color transforming politics. And we wanted, we were, I had a co director, Marjan Safinia. She's Iranian American. Um, I'm Korean American. We were telling a story that encompassed many different kinds of women, black, indigenous women of color in our story. And so we intentionally wanted to work with field directors like Yoruba, <laughs> like to tell certain stories because yes, I, you know, we have analysis of, you know, pretty sharp, like political class, race, gender analysis, but it does matter who's in the room, you know, when we're, when you're documenting communities. So we very intentionally, you know, Yoruba was covering the Georgia stories, right? Stacey Abrams and Lucy McBath. Um, and, you know, for example, in Texas, we followed Veronica Escobar. So Deb Eskenazi, who's a, a doc filmmaker in Texas, Latinx, Latina, you know, she followed Veronica and, you know, and, you know, some of us, we, we would also kind of pinch it in different opportunities. I personally had a relationship, um, you know, filming Rashida Tlaib in Michigan before. So, but, you know, Amber Ferris, who's a, uh, uh, Muslim Arab American filmmaker you know we kind of covered that story together so it's also about like I, I always ask this question like how can we tell this story in a better way you know how can we also just do justice to the story and make sure that we're you know kind of um, asking the right questions right so uh, all right let's go over here I was gonna oh go ahead um just a recent example, I was asked to make this film about this really famous Indian journalist, because, you know, I've made a film about a journalist, so I must make another one. Um, and she's 
um, India, from India, and she's being, uh, she's more trolled actually than Maria Ressa, and she's very much in the news. And I felt like I wasn't the person to tell that story. Mm. Um, so I signed on as producer and um, actually suggested uh, someone who lives in Mumbai, a documentary filmmaker, to tell that story. And I think it's, it, it, it's going to work out, you know. So sometimes it's not, I'm asked, and it's not necessarily, I'm not the person. And I think, of, you know, there's a, you know, got to be honest, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yourself. But what I love about that story is you didn't just say, I'm not the person, but you also used your clout to tell them who is the person, right? To give someone else that the opportunity to be that yeah. person. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's go over here. Hi. Uh, my name is Shamika Simpson. I am the director of tours for the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation. Woo! These young ladies <laughs> invited me here today, and I want to say thank you. I appreciate this. This has been amazing and wonderful. Um, I was um, contemplating your responses when she asked kind of how do you deal with an a fear of failure. Um, and a lot of times I've heard about a fear of success myself, you know, and that's a mind boggle, right? You feel fear, do you feel success? What it, exactly are you scared of, you know? And then the other part of that that I was thinking of is not only a fear of failure, but even an expectation of failure that other people can project upon you and any other kind of negative energy. So as you're going about a project and you were talking about how you felt about the obsession and seeing it, how do you deal with the negative energy that people want to kind of damper your, your hopes or, or, or take that kind of expectation away of your success for yourself? Well, you, you get rid of those people. <laughs> you know, you don't surround yourself. Energy is so key. Um, you know, I remember when I first started making my first film and I was so um, plagued by self-doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I remember showing a, a, like a clip that I had just, you know, I'd made like a little section um, and I showed it to somebody and they said, oh, you're a filmmaker now. And I burst out into tears mm. because I was like, I to take uh, like it's something that I so wanted to be, but was so scared of actually owning. Um, so it's just an example of what you said: the self doubt, the fear, and that's real. You know, I think that as you get more experience, <laughs> you get um, you know you learn how to manage that and how to quell that. I'm not saying that it disappears but I think it's super important one thing I will say about the documentary community generally is that I think it's a really um, uh, supportive beautiful community and that we rely on each other we call each other to talk about you know you know issues in the industry or where we are or advice or you know budgets or what have you and I think it's really about surrounding yourself with people um, who you can and rely on and have that kind of relationship with. So what kind of self-care do you practice then? Well, I'm about to go on vacation for a couple of weeks. I know so that's, that's right. That's, that's, that's one, one thing. <laughs> and I, I also too, I mean, I like, I believe in, you know, I, I believe in um, not working all the time. I'm not a workaholic. I'll say that like <laughs> to, you know, I um, believe in vacation I believe in hanging out and having fun. Um, I just saw Top Gun and really enjoyed it. It was awesome. super fun to see in the theater, to watch a, you know, so there's, uh, there's many ways that I, you know, um, personally look at self-care and, and take care of yourself. Because if your mind and your health is not, f the, you know, f taken care of, then you can't do anything. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have time for one more question, so let's go over here. Uh, what's your guys' first film? What is your first film? First is a, yeah. First film, is, mm -hmm. first film they made. First film they made or the first film they saw? The first film they made. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your first film. Um, I made a film called The Grace Lee Project, <laughs> which is a personal, so cool. Documentary, so cool. a personal documentary about um, a lot of different women named Grace Lee. I grew up cool. in Columbia, Missouri, where there were very few Asians and nobody had the name Grace. And when I started living in the East Coast, West Coast, I started meeting people who, you know, sort of told me about the other Grace Lee they knew. And so it's a film about kind of Asian American stereotypes. Um, so it's kind of a personal film. So 
Uh, Find it on Canopy. Yeah. <laughs> My first film is called Promised Land, and it's about um, the looking at the efforts uh, of the black indigenous community in South Africa to get land back that was taken from them during apartheid. And this was 10 years after the end of apartheid. And I look at um, how these uh, communities, two communities that are trying to get the land back and the white landowners as well, who are reluctant to say the least to, uh, to give the land back. It was on, on PBS. Um, my first film was Imelda, about the former Philippine First Lady Imelda Marcos, known for her 2,100 pairs of shoes. Um, I filmed, we filmed just as she was getting back from exile in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, we followed her for a couple of years. The intention of that film was that while she was still alive, I wanted to get the story through her perspective because there were a lot of um, other films being made that were like a laundry list of her sins, you know, and I, but I just wanted to see what she had to say for herself. Um, and... And she ended up suing us. That's a whole other story. But um, yeah, that was my first film. Trial by Fire, I think, my first film. My, my first film, I was lucky I, I got to go to film school. I got a Fulbright scholarship and I was able to attend grad film school. And for me, that was really helpful. I actually have a lot of uh, female friends who I think um, wanted to get involved in film and television media, but because they weren't kind of forced to do their own projects, um, they wound up working for other people on their projects and um, have, I think, felt uh, like they didn't perhaps fulfill, they didn't quite find their voice or raise their voice or use their voice and have that. And I feel really lucky because I think it is hard as a young woman. I found it really hard. I found it so challenging to to put my work up on this big screen it felt such an entitled projection of self and you know the di directorial point of view and I still think in a way do documentary I like because it's called I was like well, the world it's the world's point of view I'm not a it's not my author you know it's sort of auteur vision it's it's I'm just sort of documenting what I see rather than kind of imposing my vision and I, I found it really difficult to impose myself and um, so I felt really grateful that at film school I was forced to and it was kind of excruciating and my my first films were not on PBS or I, nobody sued me for my first films. <laughs> uh, my classmates just said, thought they were a bit crap. And, um, but I learned a lot. And then my first film was about Amish young people and their Rumspringer period. And it was called Devil's Playground and it got into HBO. But I was not young when that came out. People were like, oh, and you were so young and it was your first ever thing. And I was like, oh no. Like I had 20 episodes of Blue's Clues. <laughs> Two master's degrees, a ton of, uh, you know, jobs on film sets and um, really paid my dues for years by the time I even dared to begin that. And then it was a three year journey. Mm -hmm. So I want to end with a little lightning round of questions. Um, we will start with Lucy and work our way this way for every question. I don't need an explanation. I just need an answer. And it has to be the quickest answer. All right. <laughs> all right. So you're... Uh, <laughs> The first question is, what other female documentarians' work would you recommend? All of them. Ah, there's so many, and it's so exciting. Oh, my goodness, and from around the world. That, I mean, that's a kind of a cop-out, but, you know, my teacher was Barbara Koppel, and I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, but much as I love Barbara, I'm also like, there's some really young people that are amazing, and um, just look everywhere you can, and, 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 you know, it's fantastic. Put your eyeballs maybe um, on any woman filmmaker, and I think you're going to find some amazing work Ramona ah, same it's so hard um but okay from last year mm -hmm. the one that really blew blew me away was a first a uh, film mm -hmm. Fire Dai uh what is oh, um yeah. yeah Jessica Bashir so watch out for more of her work because it just that first it was her first film and it blew me away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um I'm going to say a film that I just saw, a filmmaker who I love, and I just saw her latest film at Tribeca called This Is Andrea, about Andrea mm -hmm. Dorkin. Mm -hmm. And why am I blanking out on... Um, filmmaker. Yes. Pratiba. Uh, Pratiba. Yeah, Pratiba. <laughs> Pratiba. Um, uh, what's her last name? Parma? Parma. No, it's Pratiba 
Parabar. I think fully people can take notes and then yes. Google. Yes, and she uh, has this amazing hybrid film about Andrea Dorkin called This Is Andrea. She also did, did a beautiful film about Alice Walker as well. I'm going to cheat, like, thinking from last year. <laughs> um, there was a film, um, oh, my God. What was it called? Um, <laughs> it was nominated, the Indian... Oh, uh, Riding, Riding, Riding with Fire. With fire um, Rintu Thomas and Shushmit Tosh. We played that last year. All right. Uh, true or false, a film is a living, breathing thing. True. 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 True or false, there have been times when I wanted to quit filmmaking. Oh, for true. Sure. true. Every day. <laughs> times every day. What time is it? <laughs> and then our last question is, what do you consider your greatest achievement? Having a career. <laughs> Having a career. I, was, I, I literally was going to say that. Being able to make a living yeah. by doing this. And the freedom to tell, not always, but sometimes. I mean, to, to um, sometimes you have more uh, kind of sole authority, if you like. But the opportunity to, the, the freedom to say what you think using the craft that has this incredible power of film. Film is such a powerful medium, right? And and we're we're in this unbelievable position where we get to um, you know, express ourselves and um, amazing privilege that that is. And, and in the process and oh sorry. Oh I mean all of this plus being able to meet so many incredible people while making the films. Like, those relationships are really special. No, I'm still, a, sorry, just quickly. I'm still amazed when an audience comes. You know, I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. Audience that's like not my family and friends, like strangers who want to see my work. Aren't you like, wow. Because you're spending two hours of your life in this theater to watch something I did that always still blows me away. Still, Somebody whose story that I think is really worth paying attention to I see something in somebody's story and oftentimes nobody else has seen that I'm like this person is interesting this person deserves that, that people listen and pay attention and learn from this person's story and that um, gives so much to that person as well um, for their for, for that to be seen you know the, the power to, for, to give somebody that they be seen thank you so much Lucy Ramona, Aruba, and Grace. And thank you all so much to you for being thank here you tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.